I'm going to read the 316 page thesis of Derek Muller, The Face of Veritasium. I want to try and understand the science behind learning through video. That sounds doable in a week, so I'm going to give myself seven days to do this. Hopefully I can get on a call with Derek Muller at the end of this project to see if I've understood what's going on or if I've just completely wasted my time. It's day one and I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is there's really only 200 pages that I need to read because there is the references, the ethical considerations, the appendix and all the other thesis information that you need to include in an academic paper. The bad news is I see a lot of physics jargon in there, like quantum mechanics, and the last time I did formal education inside of physics was at secondary school when I was doing my GCSE exams, so I reckon those chapters are going to take me quite a while to read. The first hour of reading went pretty well. What multimedia is, so any presentation that combines words and pictures to form a message, in this case a learning message. The development of technology used in education, from paper and pen to radio, TV, computers and now the internet and then it discussed how we can use the technology inside of schools and education. But then again, that was the introduction, so it's meant to be easy. The second hour of reading was about methodology and previous literature. He used design-based research which encourages interviews, video and audio tapes, transfer tests and pre-post-test measures. So test people, teach people, test people again and then ask people questions about the experience. Luckily, I am familiar with cognitive load theory, so much of that section was actually just repeated information, but if you're unfamiliar, intrinsic load is built up from prior knowledge and task demands. Extraneous load is environmental additions, typically from the teacher or instructor, which doesn't help learning, but is load nonetheless. And then there is germane load, which is the load that is useful for learning. All of this load building up in working memory, ideally trying not to overload yourself. As this is where the mental processing and supposedly all of the learning happens, according to the theory. So, I've not heard about the dual coding theory before, but it sounds very much like one of the principles from cognitive load theory, which is the multiple representation principle. Which suggests consuming something in multiple ways is better than consuming it through one, so I'm listening to the article as well as reading the article at the same time. From what I can tell, the main difference is that the dual coding theory talks about two different channels, the verbal and non-verbal channels for information to be processed, but that's it. Then naturally they have combined cognitive load theory and dual coding theory to make a new theory, the cognitive load theory of multimedia learning, which to my understanding is just using video, narrative and pictures to reduce cognitive load, but then again I could just be completely wrong. I see quantum mechanics in the next title. <laughs> yes, teaching is after it, but quantum mechanics, those words scare me. I feel like this chapter is just going to be painful. As expected, the wave functions, probability, density, barrier, parameter, quantum mechanics stuff went way over my head. Just no idea, but the prior knowledge, memory and learning stuff did make sense. Unfortunately, most of it was combined in conversation, so I needed to have a basic grasp of the topics to understand how and why the studies they were doing made sense. So I have three choices. One, I pretend I know what it's talking about and then move on. Two, I stay on this section and Google to find like half the words because I don't know what it's talking about. Or three, take a break and do it tomorrow. You know, I think my cognitive load is, is close to overloading, so I'm going to save it for tomorrow, even though I'm like 15 pages short of my target. You know that life thing we're all involved in? It never really goes to plan, does it? After checking, arguing, organising and then confirming an emergency hospital appointment, uh, I've now been on the phone for most of the day. But now I need to do the course videos that I planned to do this morning, but I was on the phone this morning instead, so my day is just disappearing. You literally can't make this stuff up, just finish the videos and the internet has gone down, so I can't listen to the paper because I use Microsoft's Edge, which means I'm actually going to have to read through the paper, which is going to take so much longer. No dual coding advantage or reduced cognitive load for me, just, just normal manual reading. And let's just say that didn't last long. I do enjoy the research process, but sometimes it can be a little bit stressful. It only took two whole days to fall behind on my van. I still have 80 pages to read and I have the hospital appointment this morning which is not going to be short. You know what? Completely forget that. The hospital appointment was only two hours and it's an hour there, hour back, so only four hours of my day have been taken out. Yes, I have football training later, but I can now go upstairs and just do loads and loads of reading to finish this paper. 
The rest of the thesis went over the studies and findings. During the studies included in the thesis, they tested physics students from different years, meaning they had different levels of understanding. Fundamental students all the way to advanced students. The different prior knowledge the students had was used to predict how useful the multimedia lesson would be, novice learners potentially preferring more instructional direct lessons with reduced sound effects and dialogue with advanced learners potentially wanting a bit of a narrative and more dialogue. Constructivism was the learning theory approach that they spoke about the most, which is essentially where learners construct or create their own ideas rather than being told by the teacher or instructor what the answer is. I've been reading for about five hours now and my brain is pretty fried, so I'm not going to go into the nuances of constructivism and social constructivism. I'm going to leave that one for tomorrow. Back on track. It's day four, and the plan is to go through all of the notes and try and make somewhat sense of them and put them into different pages. For those of you unfamiliar with Obsidian, this is what it looks like. And all of the notes from the paper that I've exported into an Obsidian note will be put into probably a couple of different notes, but I'm not sure which ones yet, so um, let's cut to where I've done that. This is one of my favourite parts of the process as I start making connections between sections of the paper, start thinking of links with other notes I already have, and start converging ideas into an outline for a page of my own, so when I read it, I don't have to think too hard as it is written in my own words. Themes like memory, learning, knowledge, conceptual change, and misconceptions came up alongside the obvious video theme. So I thought constructivism was going to be a big theme going throughout the learning category outline section, but it's not. There's so much more to it than that. And you'll see that inside of my notes, I've actually linked the source paper to so many other notes alongside the multimedia education note that there's more to this than just multimedia. At this point, I have way more questions than answers. How can cognitive load theory be used with multimedia education? How can dual coding theory be used in multimedia education? With all these learning theories, how do they apply to elements of multimedia education? The study of neuroscience is also related to multimedia education and how we perceive videos, so how can we use that to make videos more effective? And because a lot of the notes I've read so far aren't bringing anything new to the research field, it's just using old theories or old ideas or previous ideas and putting it into a multimedia environment. I'm looking forward to seeing how using dialogue in multimedia could help, using sound in multimedia could help or hinder the amount of prior knowledge that should be assumed or included inside of media, whether it's at the start, end, middle of videos, the length of the video, so should it be short, should it be long, should it be short for some people but longer for other people? And all of these questions just continue. There is like no end to these questions and I don't think there's going to be an answer but there's certainly going to be guidelines but. The big question, what makes multimedia video effective for learning? Fingers crossed, today we get some of the answers to the questions I had yesterday, but most of today is going to be just me sat in my notes and I don't think it's going to be very fun for you to just watch, so I will cut if there's anything exciting, if not then we'll probably go to tomorrow. Yesterday was my main research day, so I spent 15 plus hours just inside of my notes going through different things, so I couldn't actually record anything yesterday, so I'm doing it today, so technically this is day 7 but 6 reflections. First up we have constructivism, which promotes active learning, so testing things, doing hypothesis and creating experiments, and it suggests that observing and, and listening is more passive and isn't as beneficial for learning. But then social constructivism emphasises the importance of observation and listening as part of the learning process. This epistemological approach, theory of knowledge, suggests the idea that prior knowledge helps us construct or create new knowledge. So I knew what cognitive load theory was before reading this paper, I didn't know what dual coding theory was, so I constructed from my knowledge of cognitive load theory new knowledge in the linking between the multiple representation principle and dual coding theory. That's the idea. However, constructivism often doesn't account for working load memory limits, the capacity that we have, so instruction may actually be better than making us come up with our own ideas. But this is where vicarious learning gets involved, which is using the experience of others to help our own learning. So we could watch a conversation between a student and an instructor about an experiment, or we could read instructions about the experiment, and we could get to the same conclusion and learn the same amount of things. 
but the difference is that as we're watching someone else learn, it can trigger other things such as motivation, self-efficacy, confidence, and other elements that you can't really measure inside of learning. So the social constructivism of the vicarious learning experience can help with new knowledge, i.e. learning, but also continued learning because of the motivational factors that could be included. Being interested in the topic is obviously important, so you don't fall asleep in the lesson and actually pay attention to what you're supposed to be learning. And that could include using seductive details. In other words, information that doesn't necessarily help learning, but helps interest. But then again, it runs the risk of it being extraneous load, so it's not helping the learning and actually hindering the learning. But then again, that's a balance for every instructor to decide. The cognitive theory of multimedia learning suggests four main steps learners go through. Pick relevant words and pictures from the multimedia. Organize those words and pictures into mental models. Form relations between the words and pictures with mental models. And then integrate the information into mental models mental models being the way that we think about the concept. Now moving away from the philosophy and the theory behind the studies and going into the applications and the results that Derek found when it comes to video design. Dialogue was the main factor that was tested using misconceptions or instruction with different protocols and then also looking for feedback on sound video design and all the other elements that you would normally see inside of a video. What they found was that dialogue needed to be authentic and Socratic for it to be beneficial. So a conversation between two people using natural words, natural tones, and less formal language, less of a teacher instruction, and more of just a, a conversation. Kind of like the conversations the Physic Girls does on her channel with her editor. She has a conversation, one person knowing the information, i.e. the Physics Girl, one person asking questions, i.e. the editor, about this complex concept or topic, whatever the video's about. I know the Physics Girl and Veritasium have collaborated before, so maybe even she got the idea from Derek's research, I don't know. But what I do know from the research is dialogue is better for triggering prior knowledge than instruction. All of the video formatting can come down to it depends, but there are some guidelines that Derek goes over. Shorter videos without misconceptions were worse than longer videos with misconceptions. So shorter videos aren't always better. But if you make a video longer by adding in information, that also isn't better because it needs to be relevant to the concept and information being taught. Animation and humour typically helps younger audiences and puns were controversial in the study, but what all of it did do is trigger conversation and keep people interested. Which at the end of the day is the point of the video in my eyes, to keep people interested and to get people asking questions about the topics and concepts brought up afterwards. Cognitive load theory suggests sounds and colours should be kept to a minimum because otherwise it can be extraneous load and overload individuals, but what Derek actually found was those with higher interests, it didn't impact them that much, and the sounds and colours actually added to the interest of the video, assuming the colours weren't vibrant all over the place distracting you and the sounds weren't, like, in your face. The complexity of the video, however, is very difficult to work out and there's just a lot going on. It needs to be hard enough that learners don't shrug it off and think they know it all so that they're paying attention, but it can't be too hard that they turn off because they're mentally overloaded and don't understand what's going on. And the paper hasn't really answered this question, whether you have multiple videos for different level learners or whether you have one long video and it increases in difficulty or how you structure the expectations and assumptions of knowledge for individuals when you have a lesson. Because if you have a video for the second year students, how can you assume all those second year students have the same prior knowledge? I don't think you can. I don't know. Images and text work well together, assuming that they don't compete for your attention, so they don't split your attention. And then the referenced multimedia design principles state, Words and images should be used and are better close together at the same time, avoiding redundant information. Narration is better than on-screen text and it shouldn't be duplicated. Having said that, the modality effect, narration instead of text, and the cueing effect, using words and images instead of just text, don't seem to always hold up in authentic learning settings, i.e. not in a lab setting and when you actually go home and do learning in your own time. And that right there is exactly why Derek in his studies chose an authentic learning setting, i.e. giving videos online and letting people learn things the way that they would outside of formal education because authentic learning settings give a better representation of how learning actually happens. Then we have misconceptions, which bottom line, they're useful to talk about. 
Everyone has prior knowledge, previous experience, or preconceptions when they go into a learning environment, be it a lesson, a lecture, watching a video, or anything else. If they are misconceptions, i.e. they don't align with the scientific evidence that we currently have, then they can cause damage in two specific ways. They can give learners a false sense of knowing, so they reduce the amount of mental effort they put into learning, which you could relate to the Dunning-Kruger effect. A cognitive bias that makes people overestimate their knowledge or ability in something. Or they interfere with recently learned science, which is proactive inference favoring the prior knowledge or the misconception over the new information. But learners with a high attention capacity at the time allow them to avoid proactive inference. But as soon as other tasks are added or distractions are added, the avoidance disappears. Once again, reinforcing the focus of mental effort on learning the concept or topic. Conceptual change could be the desired result of the video using dialogue on misconceptions backed by cognitive theory of multimedia learning, but that doesn't make it quick or easy. Step one of creating cognitive conflict can be done using misconceptions. Step two of having new conceptions available is down to the video or the lesson that is after the video. Step three of the new conceptions being plausible is an ongoing battle between facts and emotions because we are biased towards previous ideas, previous beliefs, and changing someone's worldview is not easy. And the fourth step is making sure the new conceptions solve the new problem, but also give answers to old phenomena that couldn't be answered. These are the four steps explained in the thesis, but I think we need to have an understanding of behavior change, mindset, and the entire world of socialization and ontology to get a real solution that can be consistent across the board. But I think I'm going to stick to multimedia education for this video. Derek's past videos about education of science are what triggered me to want to read his thesis in the first place, concluding, Technology is not a revolution in education, but an evolution, as the medium of communication doesn't matter as much as the actual thinking that goes on in the learner's head. Clear instructional presentations are not as useful as presentations with misconceptions, because misconceptions create thinking, they create conflict, and more mental effort, which is beneficial for learning. And that we use previous information to automate our learning, but sometimes we need to challenge that automation to start learning, which again is increasing mental effort, which is beneficial for learning. Maybe you see a trend in there. The conclusion of the thesis is pretty simple. Create videos that make individuals think that are also interesting. This obviously has some conflict with the platform you're using, whether it's YouTube, TikTok, lecture presentations, or any other social media platform, which is why I've linked multimedia education with my content creation note, but the conversation isn't over. Every learner has different prior knowledge, preferences, preconceptions, interest levels, mental affordances, so some content that's good for some will be bad for others. And like Derek says in the thesis, learning and conceptual change takes time, a lot of time, in some contexts which requires practice and ongoing conversation, which is where the teachers need to get involved. So we could argue that videos are only potential cues for learning requiring either a course of videos or continued conversation in a community afterwards to keep the learning going. Unfortunately, Derek never got back to me about having a conversation about his thesis, but what he does mention towards the end of the thesis is software that goes outside of just linear multimedia. In other words, software that has different interactions, so whether that's community interactions or exploration features, which is like Obsidian, the tool that I use. My question now is not what makes multimedia video effective for learning, but what environment should the multimedia video be viewed in for effective use? i.e. view the video in a lecture and then have a conversation about it, watch it on YouTube and then go to a community section for discussion afterwards, or a separate place entirely potentially for advanced learners or learners with higher interests to explore the topic a little bit deeper. I personally use Discord as my conversation platform and I share all of my notes online for people to explore if they are curious, but I also heavily engage myself in the YouTube comment section so I am curious. What would you put in an environment to make multimedia video most effective for learning for you?